All right. Hey there, it's Bram Kanstein and this is Bitcoin for Millennials. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting app. This will help me reach a wider audience and educate more people on Bitcoin together with my guests. And in this episode, I'm joined by Richard Byworth. He's managing partner at alternative investment manager Seas Capital. With 25 years of investment experience, he leads the 1.3 billion liquid alternative business. And he's also a board member of the Bitcoin only Swiss brokerage Relay. We discuss Bitcoin's role in financial security, challenging threat, fi and government power, how it represents truth in money, why it's the least riskiest asset that you can own and its potential for exponential growth. I absolutely love this conversation. I think it's in my personal top three of this entire podcast. So please give it a listen and let me know what you think. Enjoy this episode. All right, Richard Byworth, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks, Bram. Very happy to be here. Very good to talk to you again. Yeah, last time we we talked and and met, I think we jammed uh, for over an hour. So I think I think we'll have fun on this uh, on this recording. I uh, I don't remember if we actually talked about like your your background and how you got into Bitcoin, but I think that would be nice to start with for uh, for the people listening. Sure, absolutely. So um, I'm not a millennial. I'm a, a Gen Xer. And, uh, I did pretty much spend my entire career in traditional finance. I was a trader, uh, in an investment bank for the first five years of my career. Then I moved to Japan, uh, where I became a salesperson for derivative product and convertible bonds, which is a very interesting product to understand in the context of what companies like MicroStrategy are doing to harness volatility to create much cheaper debt. And so, you know, we can talk about that at some point as well. Um, but that was my specialty for the large proportion of my career. And then, so I was working for the Japanese bank, uh, Nomura. And uh, in the financial crisis, Nomura ended up buying Lehman Brothers, um, Asian and European operations. And so I ended up um, managing not just the convertible bond team, but also the derivatives derivatives team, the uh, futures and options team, and the Delta One team for uh, Asian product, um, Asia PAC product, including Japan uh, for Nomura, which at that point ended up becoming one of the biggest names in the space. We did some of the largest convertible bond deals in Asia. You'll have heard of companies like SoftBank and uh, China Unicom. So we did debt, debt financing for them through convertible bond structures. Um, and then, um, post the financial crisis, as interest rates went to zero and we printed a ridiculous amount of money, I became very interested in, you know, how do you allocate capital, uh, to protect your money against what is very clearly a debasement of the currency. And I was working in one of the top financial institutions. I spoke to all the top strategists, all the top economists in the institution, you know, FX strategist Net Jens Nordvig, um, the Asia strategist Sean Darby, these are famous guys in the traditional finance space. And, you know, no one gave me a sensible reason as to why we weren't just completely destroying our money. And <laughs> I didn't know about Bitcoin then. This was early 2009. Obviously, I, I hadn't heard of it. Um, so I started buying gold uh, as a protection uh, asset for you know, my savings. And uh, I was starting to think about having kids at that point, And I wanted to make sure that, you know, this was not going to all be for nothing. And uh, so I started buying gold. And um, interestingly, about six months later, I did hear about Bitcoin for the first time. Um, but I completely dismissed it, assumed it was some scam on the internet. I had no understanding that there were only 21 million coins or anything like that that would create such hardness around the asset. Anyway, as the zero interest rate um, policy and the printing of money began to percolate into the system, that created a real commoditization of the products that I was dealing with. So if you can imagine, when you're sitting in an investment bank, 
you're dealing with hedge funds, you're dealing with some of the smartest investors in the world and facing off with them on fairly complex products like convertible bonds and derivatives. And when markets are difficult and volatile, spreads can be quite wide. And you as the investment bank make money when people trade the spread because they'll buy at the top end of the spread and they'll sell at the bottom end of the spread. But as risk was basically taken down, volatility was reduced in the system. Balance sheet costs went very, very low. Interest rates went to zero. So spreads went like this. So it became very, very hard to make money. And I was just getting more and more disillusioned with the business because it was becoming commoditized. And so in 2017, I ended up leaving the business. I was actually going to join a private equity firm. And at the time, I'd recently invested in a Bitcoin mining company. And the founder happened to be meeting me the day that I exited the bank um, for an update over breakfast. And he said to me, he said, well, look, if you're free now, why don't you come and help me build this company? And I said, well, you know, what do I know about uh, getting cheap electricity or hardware infrastructure? And I, I can't help you. And he said, uh, well, actually, crypto as a broad industry is full of people that don't know anything about traditional finance. They don't understand about financial products. They're all flaunting AML, KYC laws. They don't know what they're doing. Um, there's going to be a huge regulatory clampdown. We could build a very regulatory focused organization. So that's what I did. Um, I left the bank. I joined, I joined that firm. I ended up becoming the CEO after about six months. And we built an asset manager, a trading platform, a custodian, an exchange. We actually listed the company on NASDAQ in September 2020 through a SPAC offering. And then uh, in 2021, Binance approached us. They were starting to have their problems and we were having problem with customer traction. So it was a nice match from the board's perspective. Um, I didn't agree with getting into bed with Binance, so I stepped mm. down from the company. And, uh, and so I ended up sitting on a beach in Costa Rica uh, when my phone rang, and um, it was a gentleman called Mark Sees, who is from the Sees family in Switzerland, and asked me to come and build the hedge fund business for him uh, in his alternative asset manager, which is Sees Capital. So I've been there for two years and building that, that business out. And one of the products we've launched is a, is actually in partnership with a famous Bitcoiner called Willy Wu. Uh, we've launched a fund of crypto hedge funds, um, called Seas Crest. And, uh, yeah, we target, um, a, a return of around 15 to 20% a year. Now I, uh, as a Bitcoiner, it's, it's sometimes hard to get your head around why you would issue a product like that. But yeah. I think, I think that the recent volatility in the market and the huge drawdowns that we've seen on the back of, you know, jump trading's failure or, or sort of exit from the market or the US government selling their Bitcoin or the German police selling their Bitcoin. If you have a place where you're sitting with dollars, allocated and making a constant return on dollars to pay your daily bills, then you are essentially financially free and you don't ever have to sell your Bitcoin because you can redeem from a product like that yeah. or recall uh, the investments. So that's the sort of thing um, that Bitcoin has used this product for. And myself and Willie, obviously, um, being two investors in the fund as well. Yeah. You just uh, said... As a Bitcoiner, you said, so you are a Bitcoiner. I, uh, you know, when, when we talked last time, I think uh, that, that became very clear to me. But you said when you discovered it or heard about it, you know, and, and of course it was very, very early on, right? So mm -hmm. I think in general, way harder to judge, right? Um, whatever, what, what, whatever the, it was or could be, but, if you, if you, if you think about it, was there anything you said you dismissed it, but was there like a belief or like, 
now that you look back, a way of thinking or you know not being curious enough or wh- whatever that that held you back? How do you, how do you look back on that? Because I think there's a there's a big lesson for for anyone listening there, right? Anyone still thinking about you know should I study Bitcoin or or not? Yeah, look, I grew up in an age before the internet. Um, which I don't think is the case for most of your audience. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about when payments first started happening on the internet, it was all about how many people were getting their credit card details stolen. We're getting, uh, you know, payments made in their name. So nothing from my generation, it was very normal to not trust what was happening on the internet. So when I heard about Bitcoin, admittedly, I did no research whatsoever. I, just assumed as it was a payment mechanism on the internet that it was a scam. Funny. And it was funnily enough, it was a, a, a guy who was, yeah, probably a millennial. Uh, he was, yeah, well, he would have been. He was 27 years old at the time in 2009. And he came to me and he said, look, Rich, I think you should look at Bitcoin. And uh, he worked for me. And he'd come over from Lehman Brothers, actually. He was super smart. Um, and, uh, the problem was he was quite lazy. So uh, it was always very hard to get him focused (laughs) on the job at hand of hitting the phones and selling to our client. And, um, so I was naturally just like, will you just get on and do your job and stop focusing on nonsense? And, um, yeah. That was probably the most expensive mistake I will ever make. Um, I want to say classic Tratfi guy. (laughs) Yeah. Absolutely. That's a chat for a guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, very happy to admit it now. I think if he could have said anything to me at mm. that point in time to just make the penny drop, because I was already thinking about it, was this is the first time that we have absolute scarcity in an asset. There will only ever be 21 million. Yeah. That would have, that would have got me listening. The problem I had, I didn't know that about Bitcoin probably until 2018. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah, it's so interesting because you, you, around that time, you were like early, early thirties, right? You said, you know, uh, maybe you want to start a family. I, you understood, you know, fiat money debasement. You started buying gold, right? So the, the problem was pretty clear, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think in general, gold is partially a solution, but I think it's funny, you know, uh, that, that you say you didn't grow up with, um, you know, a, a digital world. I think the millennials mm-hmm. are, you know, on this edge of, mm-hmm. you know, half your youth is analog, half your youth, um, plus your adulthood obviously is digital, right? And so, for example, for me, I find gold weird, right? Like if I see gold 
bars in. Uh, I, I, I tweeted this uh, like a few weeks ago. There was a guy who, who posted like a suitcase full of gold bars. And when you said anything digital uh, is probably a scam, right? For me, it ju- it's just so nonsensical that you have like a shiny rock and you need like three tools to determine if it's real. You cannot take it anywhere. You cannot divide it at a store or whatever. Like it, for me, it makes no sense, you know? And when you said buying gold, was that physical gold or was it paper gold? Back then it was physical gold. Um, okay. yeah, we had a, a, an absolute gold maxi, if you can call, call them that, uh, on our desk. And he would gladly escort anyone down to the gold market in Hong Kong and, uh, it, yeah, take them to the dealer and, uh, and, and you and could take the out. gold with you. Yep. Oh, yep. wow. Yeah. Okay. And so was your aha moment and also realizing the, the finite digital scarcity? Yeah. That's so funnily enough, it was listening to a podcast, um, with Murad and, uh, Anthony Pompliano. That one is um, great. I know. It was a good one. A big, yeah. a big influence for my, for me as well. That one yeah, specifically. That was the tail end of, which is why I feel a responsibility to do podcasts mm. today is, is because I feel that this is such a great way of communicating with a broad base of people. And it's the way that I managed to finally understand that inherent scarcity to Bitcoin. It was tail end of 2018. We were right at the bottom of the bear market or, or just about to be, sorry, it was October, 2018. So we still set trading at 6,000 and then, um, and then you had another gap lower. But I remember listening to that podcast before going to bed and waking up the following morning. It was a Saturday morning and saying, I don't have anywhere near enough Bitcoin. Yes. And it's so funny. You say this, I had the exact same, this is in my top three of podcasts actually. And yeah. I, I just looked it up for the people listening. It's Murat uh, Mahmoudov, uh, the ultimate Bitcoin argument on mm-hmm. Anthony Pompliano's channel. It's November 2, 2018. Um, yeah, okay. inter- interesting, you have to say. Yeah, that was that was the podcast for me. And um, that was the point where I was like, okay, I really need to get a lot of Bitcoin. In 2017, it, it, you know, I got to the point of saying, okay, this is interesting. But I yeah. still didn't properly understand it. I didn't read the white paper until middle of 2018. I messed around with altcoins for the first part of my experience and journey, just because, you know, very, very simple unit bias that I think a lot of people have is when you look at Bitcoin, you go, shit, back then it was $9,000 or whatever mm. it was. You're like, well, I can buy you know, 10,000 of these old coins. For <laughs> Shonky donkey coin. <laughs> Shonky donkey <laughs> coin, indeed. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people fall into that trap of, of the unit bias, Yeah, um, which is, you know, it is a problem for Bitcoin because, you know, the amount of people that I speak to when you talk about Bitcoin and explain it to them, they say, well, you know, I can't afford a Bitcoin. What other coin should I buy? What's going to be the next Bitcoin? And you're like, well, no, that's, that's really not what's going on here. And so, um, you know, just to get back to your question, the aha moment was late 2018. Um, but I had spent a good year messing around with altcoins at that point. Yeah. Um, but you so know, how would you describe the difference be- between that? You know, if people have to yeah. judge what to focus on. Sure. Bitcoin is truly decentralized. Bitcoin is the only fair launch. Um, the fact that Satoshi did what he did makes me really question who the hell Satoshi was. And, you know, we can get into a whole discussion about that. But I really believe that Bitcoin is a gift to humanity. And the other altcoins are just you know, fake copies where the founders hold 70% of the coins and, you know, they're predominantly proof of stake mechanisms, which means the founders control the consensus mechanism and they can change the protocol anytime they like. Bitcoin's proof of work. 
And if you want to change Bitcoin, you can run away and do your own Bitcoin in a soft or hard fork. And, um, you know, you're, you're creating a whole new chain and people might follow you. They might not. And we've seen this a hundred times with Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV. You know, all these are failed projects. Bitcoin Core is what it is because it is ossifying around that original protocol design. Yeah. that Satoshi made and the truth that that provides all of us in an asset and more importantly in a money, a money where we store our time and our work. And, you know, I can't think of anything more noble than someone walking away from what they created to make sure that the creation worked. Um, I don't think there are many people on the planet that would have done that. Maybe yeah. Mother Teresa or well, or or they're or they're dead, right? Yeah. Um, I'm I'm kind of on the trail of um, John Nash is Satoshi, you know, John Nash from A Beautiful Mind, uh, from the movie uh, A Beautiful Mind, with Russell Crowe. Okay, interesting. It's a Nobel Prize winning mathematician. He he has uh, there's there's entire uh, X accounts dedicated to sharing quotes and uh, articles that he wrote. Um, few episodes back, I actually talked to Brian Solston, who is writing a book on this, that, that he might be it. It's very interesting. He, so he's a mathematician. He's into game theory, talks a lot about money. Um, so, well, mm -hmm. that's a whole nother thread, but, uh, yeah. Do you like how, how you explain Bitcoin, right? Like it's, uh, or the difference with, with crypto. I usually say, you know, crypto is an attempt by startups to create an ecosystem that, you know, does X, Y, Z. And then within that ecosystem, there's a token that fuels doing X, Y, Z, right? And X, Y, Z should in theory solve the problem, right? Or serve, serve a need. And therefore with users, there's like an ecosystem created. Whereas Bitcoin is a protocol, just a set of rules that is uh, guarded by uh, a network of computers. And from what that set of rules produ produces basically, or just following that set of rules. From there, I think the, the currency springs, right? The asset, the store of value, because following the rules and keeping the ledger immutable, basically, um, that is where the value comes from. And because of the characteristics of being able to send it, hold it, divided, all these things, that's where kind of the, the, the asset comes from. But that's also why I think it's hard to understand because it's so much in one thing, right? How, how, how do you explain that when, when you talk to people? Like what, what is your approach there? It depends who I'm talking to. So if I'm talking to a TradFi person, then I will explain that crypto is venture and Bitcoin is digital gold. And mm. the two are completely different things. If you think about them in an investment portfolio, you know, gold is, you know, how you store value. It's where you, where you put your risk free portion of your portfolio. Um, venture is, you know, to all intents and purposes is gambling. And that is what crypto is. Um, you're with venture, you're gambling with a little bit of inside intelligence on the founder. Um, you know, really, when you're investing in venture, you need to make sure that you're investing in a founder and a founding team that will fight through the hardship and the challenges. The problem with crypto is that when you go and hand a founder tens or hundreds of millions of dollars and say, go build something, that's, that's not how venture works. And we've seen it a thousand times in crypto where that money just gets completely wasted and investors have nothing to show for it. And we have dead protocols all over the place. So, you know, I always say, if you really must touch the crypto side, understand that crypto is a completely different ballpark to Bitcoin. If you want to invest in crypto, give your money to a competent, venture capital manager in the crypto space, Polychain, Pantera, Very Early Ventures, these types of people. 
don't try and play it yourself because you are gambling. Yeah. And if you're serious about making money in the space, give the money to them because they have the inside information. They get to invest in the deal way before you do as a, as a normal retail investor. All you're doing by participating as retail in that altcoin and crypto market is just being cannon fodder for these VCs because yeah. you are the exit liquidity. Make exactly. no mistake. Yeah. Make no mistake. You're the exit liquidity. These people are there to make money, right? And you're the easy target because you're taken up on greed or nihilism or just no hope. And it's like playing the lottery every week is, oh, I'm going to gamble on this ridiculous token next. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the VC game on steroids, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thousand X. Yeah. Yeah. But Bitcoin is, is completely different to all of that. Bitcoin is truth. As you rightly said, it's protected by a, the hugest network of computers the world over to make sure and maintain those rules of the algorithm. And the algorithm is honest and truthful and everybody can see what it is doing. And that is your money. And that is, you want truth in your money, right? I mean, I explain to my kids often, I mean, they always ask me, you know, dad, why do you talk about Bitcoin all the time? I'm like, well, you know, you know how much time dad spends working? Well, you know, imagine that I'm working for bits of paper and those bits of paper can be printed by some guy who has the right to do that. He, you know, I worked my whole life for a pile that might be this big. Yeah. This guy can go and print 15 buildings worth of that paper in five minutes and dilute the work of my entire uh, life. Is that fair? And, you know, my 12 year old and my 14 year old, like, hell, hell no, that's not fair. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I feel, uh, you know, and you and I talked about this before, that we both feel a responsibility having understood Bitcoin and being some of the few people that understood what it means for the world, that we need to communicate that and we need to help people understand that. Yeah. It's a now, I wanted to ask you, why is Bitcoin such a big idea? But you said uh, B Bitcoin is truth. I, I think that's the answer. That's also a big <laughs> answer, right? If we dive into that a little bit, what, what does it mean that that is truth? And what does it mean for the people that adopt that truth? So if you think about the monetary base that we offer, operate off at the moment, we, we all know, if you ask anybody, do you think that paper money has any value? They're going to say, no, absolutely not. But when you then combine that with the fact that there is somebody just constantly printing more and more and more of it, it's changing the way that you measure everything. So yes. you as a shopkeeper versus you as a client, neither of you really know what the eggs should be worth in this constantly fluctuating currency that you're trying to measure things from. It's like a, uh, I've, I've heard, I know you've heard the analogy before is a, when you have a meter stick and it's constantly changing and it's how the hell are you supposed to build a house yeah. is the same thing, right? And so when you remove truth from money, then you end up with all sorts of secondary effects. And it, you know, that I strongly believe that a lot of the mental illness in the world is related to the fact that people don't understand what is happening. They don't understand why they can't feed their family. They don't understand why, even though they might have got a 5% pay increase year over year, they're still worse and worse off. And this is because there's no truth in the money. If there was truth in the money, and Bitcoin is the ultimate truth in money because it's completely fixed as a supply, then there would be no ongoing um, spiral downwards. In fact, it would be the other way around where your money would just buy you more and more every year as economy becomes more and more productive every year and more bountiful. And therefore your money, that hard money, which is the denominator and 21 million only is, is the measuring stick. And so yeah. it buys you more and more, which means as a, 
human society, we become wealthier and wealthier through the productivity gains that Silicon Valley are creating or, you know, other venture areas and technology innovations in the world. Yeah. I think to add to that, uh, we say measuring stick, you know, and the measuring stick is the price, right? So the currency units are used to put a price on, you know, a box of eggs, basically, or bag of apples, whatever. And because the measuring stick is fluctuating, you pay different prices at different times for the same things. But if you think about money in terms of energy, right? If we are exchanging energy with each other, if you think about, you know, growing an apple, the energy that's uh, needed by the sun, right? And the water and what the tree puts in to create an apple or what the chicken has to do to lay an egg, right? Um, that has not uh, changed. So I always think about it like this, like the same amount of energy is in an apple and what you pay for the apple is uh, a price, right? The reward for, for the person creating uh, or growing growing the apple. But it actually diminishes the also the effort that's been put into growing the apple, right? Or Or holding the chicken to create the egg. Also, that's, I think, a second order effect is, you know, GMO manipulation of growing apples or... Uh, you know, mass um, housing of chickens, etc. Right? Not biological, all, the, all these things anymore. Just so the producers on the other side. So you're, we we talked about the consumer side, but also on the producer side, there's all these effects of them trying to play the game of this ever changing mm -hmm. uh, measuring stick, right? And if we talk about Bitcoin as the truth, it's more I think about an economic constant. I heard uh, Nico Yuk say, I think, right? Like a, a constant in the economic arena basically where mm. um yeah if you produce a valuable good uh and and i do do that too then the the competition will be in there not in about not in you know who's best at exploiting this changing measuring stick all the time because that measuring stick is a is a constant it's not changing right so that equalizes the market in a sense yeah it's important to know that the measuring stick is changing, but it's changing in one direction. They're yeah. <laughs> always inflating the money supply. Yeah. So you're always getting poorer. And so, you know, you said there's that sort of leakage of the energy. I forget how you put it, but essentially it's the theft mm. of the energy by the people printing the money and getting the value for that money. Or where that value is going. And, it, you know, unfortunately, it's created a massive wealth divide because the money has flowed into the financial markets and pushed up the stock markets, pushed up the bond markets, pushed up real estate prices. And this is, you know, obviously one of the reasons which I think your podcast is extremely important because the people, the generation that are suffering the most at this point are the millennials, right? You haven't had a chance to make your money and to store your money in the stock market. I mean, you may have done because you're an older millennial, but some of the younger cohort and certainly Gen Z are really going to be struggling to ever get on the housing ladder um, yeah. because they never managed to get that first step before we got to this ridiculous level of printing of money. And I think this is what's so cruel about this is so unjust and i think that this is this is why the, what you're doing and trying to communicate to that sector of society is so important because you know i i had lunch yesterday with uh an investor a 74 year old guy who had um watched the summit that we hosted in may uh with jeff booth um, who I think you've also had on the show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I always get someone interesting to speak at our summits about Bitcoin. And, uh, Jeff really blew everybody's mind at, at the summit. And so after three years of hearing these Bitcoin talks, this investor came to me at the summit. He said, okay, Richard, I, I need you to take me for lunch and I need you to explain Bitcoin to me. Okay. 
Now, remember, this is a guy who has been so successful in his life, so successful in his career, and then so successful in allocating the rewards of his career into the financial markets. And so everything about the current system works extraordinarily well for him. Exactly. Yeah. So if you think about it, it's so much harder for him to understand why Bitcoin is interesting than it would be for a millennial, which in a way is a nice balancing of all of this, right? It's like when we talk about nation state adoption, you know, the bigger countries, the more successful democracies, they don't need Bitcoin like Zimbabwe or Argentina or El Salvador. Right. The people in those countries, they need it more. So they're adopting it faster. And so this is somehow a fairer distribution. And it means that you're going to have a shift in the overall, um, wealth of society to younger people that have been left out of the traditional financial system, but also younger and smaller and less wealthy countries that have been left out of the financial system as it plays out. So. <clears throat> All that to say, I think it is um, actually a very fair uh, outcome that we're starting to see. And that's why I think your show is so very important. Yeah, thank you. I, re I really appreciate that. I think to add to that, I, I, I also think millennials are the gener generation poised to understand Bitcoin and adopt it and 100% agree with what you said. And that's also, by the way, why boomers who are into Bitcoin are, are the biggest signal to me, because I 100% agree with your point. Like for them, it's the hardest to challenge their mind, right? And turn around and understand like, okay, I got rich or maybe I got lucky anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, this system I participated in is not a good system. There is a better system and I'm open to that, right? So for me personally, that's a, a big signal, but I do feel, and it's also one of the reasons why I started this is that that old game is sold to millennials, right? So it is sold to you, you know, investing in the stock market or buying real estate or, you know, gold it also flows around, etc. But as, as Michael Saylor also says, right, we live in the 21st century, it's 2024 and everything in finance is based on a hundred year old system almost, yeah. right? It's analog. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's mega analog, right? And so again, I think that's also why millennials are poised to, uh, understand Bitcoin because it is digital, but it's also connected to the physical world, right? Mm -hmm. Through pr proof of work. But really? the fact that we are still being sold that game, I think is the biggest thing that, that people should challenge themselves with. I actually never understood stocks. Interesting enough, I never, I never did that. I actually only started thinking about, you know, saving wealth or building wealth when I actually got into Bitcoin more. Uh, I did, I did try stocks and stuff, but not, not super, super heavy or something. I'm way too emotional to trade in, in general. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting. And like, how, how do you then compare these other assets that you can use to save wealth with Bitcoin? So like, well, you got gold. People talk a lot about real estate, right? In my country, I see ads all the time about, you know, getting real estate in Spain and, uh, you know, all these projects, whatever. Yeah. How, how do you put them next to each other or how do you weigh the, the differences? I think, uh, it's all about um, dilution. So if you think about, um, it, it's back to that 21 million number. It's just so very important, the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin. And again, you know, you think about gold, right? There's plenty of gold in the ground. It's just very costly to extract, right? Gold's trading at whatever it is, $2,600 an ounce, right? If it were to trade at $5,000 an ounce, then suddenly there were, there are planes of gold the world over that suddenly become profitable to extract gold from. And you'll have a huge increase in the amount of gold. Or you'll have a huge increase on the estimated production of gold that year. So gold is not finite. It is close to being finite because 
if you think about the stock of gold and the amount of flow that is produced every year, then as a percentage, it's quite small. I think we're at something like 2% mm-hmm. production of gold a year. But as I said, if, if you saw gold move to $5,000 per ounce, you'd suddenly see it move to maybe 5 or 10%. And that would be quite a hefty dilution in a single year for gold. Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. Bitcoin can go to $15 million because Robert Kennedy gets into power and he starts trying to buy 4 million Bitcoin and everybody knows that's what he's trying to do. No more Bitcoin is going to get issued. So it's completely finite. And that goes to everything. It goes to stocks. Google stock is trading, whatever it is, $160. If that starts trading at $1,600, you know, Google board are going to go, well, hang on a minute. Our stock is completely mispriced. Let's issue some stock. Let's sell some stock and we can use that to grow the company or put into our uh, innovation division or whatever it might be. So stocks will grow. Gold will grow. Bonds will grow in the same way, you know. By definition, right? Yeah. By definition, if the price goes up enough, you're going to see dilution you're going to see increased dilution and the market will correct because you'll have so much dilution, right? So you'll have a a return to earth. And the point is, and this is the thing, everyone looks at Bitcoin and goes, oh, it's so volatile, I can't touch it. But that's only because you've got idiots like the German police selling 50,000 Bitcoin or the DOJ selling Bitcoin to try and spike Trump because he said he's going to hold the Bitcoin and so this becomes a political bipartisan issue. You know, you've got these factors that are weighing on the price. But once all of this clears out and you get to a point where Bitcoin is being held by a larger proportion of the population that understand it, some nation states, a growing amount of corporates, as Michael Saylor famously says, the price will go up forever. You won't have the downside volatility that you have with Bitcoin today. The downside volatility you have with Bitcoin today is because people genuinely believe when the PayPal former CEO gets on CNBC and says Bitcoin's going to zero, you know, if he's saying that in a bear market environment, people might just believe it. And suddenly they're selling this asset that is, you know, the most finite asset that humans have ever known. Actually, the former PayPal CEO, David Marcus, is a full-blown Bitcoiner, right? I don't think David was uh, the CEO. Uh, I was talking about another chap who I I saw. I think he was the CEO, no? He was at PayPal. Uh, I don't think he was the CEO. But um, I just watched a clip today with this guy who was the former CEO in the last bear market when Bitcoin was 6,000. And he was saying Bitcoin's going to zero. And here we are, that was four years Fascinating, ago. Fascinating, no? Here we are, ten, ten, uh, four years later, and yeah. uh, it's 10x. Yeah. And this guy's an expert because he runs a payment network. And it was very interesting because he was talking about, well, you know, PayPal never goes down, Visa never goes down. Well, you know, two weeks ago, we saw what happened when uh, Cloudflare uh, had issues. Both of those companies went down, Bitcoin kept running. And, you know, you have, and he could not get his mind around the fact because he comes from such a privileged position, being a wealthy guy in the United States, Mm -hmm. he couldn't understand that actually it's really important to have a money that you can move without the permission of somebody else. Exactly. But that's, that's, that's where his whole company is built upon. (laughs) So he would never say that. Yeah. I just checked. David Marcus was president at, at uh, PayPal, but isn't it? So I, I, I have worked in TradFi only like four, four years of the past uh, 12, but, uh, uh, but, but I, I do not have an economic or, or finance background. But what I find so fascinating is that people in tech, especially fintech or like a guy that, that you just described, right? That they are not into Bitcoin is mind boggling to me, right? Like I, I, I have these questions like, do they understand what money is? Do they, do they actually understand what they do? Right? Like I, I worked at a big bank and once I realized that the number in your banking app is literally a number in a database, it represents promises or something. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 there's no tangible thing that connects the number in the database to the, to the, to the number that's shown in your app, right? There, there's nothing. 
lit- literally nothing, right? And so they're moving numbers. Mm-hmm. But when you look at Bitcoin, also why it's so volatile, right? It, it's the only 24-7, 365 final settlement market in the world. Once I understood what final settlement is, right? So I send you Bitcoin, it's totally yours and it's not in my possession anymore. Mm-hmm. That That was also a light bulb moment for me, actually, mm-hmm. that there is nothing uh there there is nothing like that basically you 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 talk about traditional finance and you talk about you know knowing about stocks or not knowing about stocks i mean i spent the majority of my career in traditional finance yeah. and in investment banks working alongside some of the best paid people in the financial industry and what i can tell you is that the large majority of people in traditional finance do not understand traditional finance. They don't understand derivative products. They don't understand convertible bonds. They don't understand anything that is slightly technical. And I'll tell you why. Because of ego. Because when you get to a certain position in an investment bank, you don't ever want to look stupid. You don't ever want to admit that you don't know something. You, <laughs> you know, you're there because you're amazing. Yes. You're getting paid ridiculous amounts of money because you're amazing. And this all feeds into this giant ego that many of these people have. And, you know, Jeff calls his venture company Ego Death. And I think Ego Death is such a perfect name for a company related to Bitcoin because you need to kill your ego to understand what this is. You have to admit you were wrong. I had to admit I was wrong to call Bitcoin a scam. I had to admit that I didn't understand how it worked. I had to read the white paper and be a complete idiot reading that white paper time and time again to try and understand what it even meant. (laughs) And I had to say, I don't understand this and work through it and be humble and say, I don't understand something. And I want to understand something. And you can only get to, I want to understand if you kill your ego, right? You can only get to the final point of understanding if you kill your ego. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, because of what I just said, that this allows people that haven't necessarily got the fortuitous huge salaries that an investment banker and bonuses might make get the opportunity to buy Bitcoin before the smart money. Yes, exactly. Right. And this is what's so poetic about it all. Yes. Right. One of my best friends is working, and I'm obviously not going to say which fund, but one of the largest hedge funds in the world. He is super smart. Super smart. Way, way smarter than me, you know, did every finance and, you know, uh, understands every complex derivative you can possibly imagine um, at, at some of the, the greatest schools in the world, and he will not understand Bitcoin. He just will not understand it. Yeah. You know, it, it's just for him, it's all about liquidity. Bitcoin goes up because of liquidity. It's a risk on asset. That's how he thinks about it. He won't go further than that because he's just bucketing it as he sees every other asset. Yeah. And he's done extremely well through his career doing that. So why not? Why not continue with that model, right? It's so interesting. Like, how do you visualize that, right? When you say that, I think about he's winning at a game that he doesn't actually understand or something like that. Or he understands the game, but that's it's built on something that he doesn't understand or something like that, right? It's, it's... No, no. He, the, the game, he understands the game fully. Yeah. Okay. He understands the game yeah. fully. He has never taken the time to understand Bitcoin. And that's the thing, because he doesn't need to. He just looks at it and goes, that's risk on, that's mm. a liquidity trade. It's completely correlated with the NASDAQ. That's, I, I think about it as a tech stock. That's it. That's it. So it's, yeah. is it a totally different game then? Bitcoin is, a, you know, it's a totally different system, right? Yeah. That's the point. We are, moving to that system of base currency in in my view because more and more people adopt it 
as they adopt it. And again, I have, I just had uh, a drink with someone before this, this podcast. And I was saying, look, when you start understand, and they never even looked at Bitcoin. And I said, look, you, you'll start and you'll say, okay, 1%. I'll make a 1% allocation because it's not going to affect me too much if I lose all my money. And then you'll study it a bit and you go, okay, maybe I can move to 5%. And actually it's doing really well. Maybe I should move to 10%. And then gradually you just go. And I think everybody slowly moves to that point. And, you know, we don't need to discuss where you're at in terms of percentage, but you know, I, pe- I know people that are now a hundred percent and they sell a little bit of Bitcoin every month to, to pay their bills. Now, you know, I'm not anywhere near that point personally, but you know, I think if you spend enough time in this world, then that's where you eventually go to because, you know, I have investments in illiquid assets that have been locked up for years and years. And so obviously they're not going to be in Bitcoin or Bitcoin related instruments. Yeah. So what happens is you have people start to invest and allocate into Bitcoin more and more and more. And it puts more and more energy and power into that system. And you see the dollar system essentially being demonetized and the, you know, the fiat currency system being demonetized. Because if you move and then everybody in Holland moves to Bitcoin only, then, you know, assuming you were still using the Gilda, that Gilder basically goes to zero. Right. Yeah. And you, di- you disempower the government that is, you know, choosing to wage war in Israel or Ukraine or wherever it might be because they can't print the money. They can't steal from you anymore because no one wants their money. Yeah. Right. So it's a shift. I think with the uh, euro, it might be a bit more difficult, but uh, this is also what Jeff Booth told me because I asked him, um, something about the future or something. And then he said, but you can move now. And then I realized that that was also one of my light bulb moments where I realized that that was when I worked at the bank. I had a colleague tell me the money in the bank is not yours. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, okay, but I can just move to this other thing. You you don't have to wait or something like you, you can actually do, do that now. Right. And, and what you mean by demonetizing is that people will just slowly pick a better money to store mm-hmm. their wealth in, right? Yeah. And people always ask me, where's it going? What price is it going to? And, you know, the point is that you're looking at it from the wrong angle. You need to be thinking about how much Bitcoin you have. Yeah. Right. Not where it's going. Dollar price doesn't matter because dollar price will go through the moon at some point. So it, it's really about making sure that you shift, you make that shift early. To Jeff's point, to your point, if you shift early, you get rewarded for it. You've taken risk because it's not a done deal yet. You know, something might happen. There are risks. You can never, and that's one thing that I have learned from traditional finance, there's, there's never certainty. And if it was certainty, Bitcoin would already be trading at $59 million or whatever it is. Yeah. Right? So how do you, how do you define risk in, in financial terms? Like, and eventually do you think Bitcoin is risky? I think B- Bitcoin is the least risky investment of any asset that you can find. I think real estate is a scary investment. I see that as a bubble that will demonetize. I think the gold will just drift down and lose money against Bitcoin. I think, you know, the stock market is, is a loser's casino. It's, it's really, really hard to consistently make money in the stock market, which is why Warren Buffett says just, you know, buy the S&P tracker and forget about it because stock picking is, is just such a difficult game. Um, so if I think about Bitcoin as a risk asset compared to other risk assets, I think it's, it's barely even a risk asset. What I'm talking about is what are risks to Bitcoin? And, you know, we talk about quantum computing. There is obviously SHA-256 signatures within Bitcoin. 
that are essentially quantum proof if you don't have multiple UTXOs in your wallet. But, you know, we don't know how far this can go. And if you're unlucky and the quantum computer managed to guess your public key with your private key, then you've lost your funds. Mm. So there is always risk of that happening. Um, if China were to have a functioning and viable quantum computer before the West and chose rather than to attack US infrastructure, they chose to start stealing Bitcoin out of wallets, then, you know, maybe that's a risk. It, it definitely is a risk. I think that there is quantum resistance built into the Bitcoin protocol um, that can be soft forked. Um, so it's essentially ready to go. So I'm, you know, there's always risk. There's yeah. always risk. But I feel less concerned about the majority of risks that you would look at normal assets within that particular framing. Yeah. When Bitcoin drops, I definitely don't look at it and think, okay, maybe the bubble's deflating. I think this is a discount. This is a, an increased discount to what it already is a discount to fair value. Right. I think in general, this is a nice leeway into the game theory part I wanted to talk about because you could say, right, like, okay, you, if you have this quantum computer and you want to direct it towards destroying Bitcoin, right? There's, there's people that argue, well, eventually the benefits of Bitcoin of adopting it outweigh the benefits of attacking it. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think is part of this global game theory. Let's call it a discussion, right? Um, but uh, yeah, what, so, sorry, what was your last point again? I want to say something about that. Um, um, I was just talking about how, for me, this is the lower, lowest risk of all financial assets. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about when Bitcoin rallies, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it, or, or it falls, sorry, that's not a bubble deflating, that's a discount to already a very discounted price. Yeah, exactly. I think these fluctuations in price are also little ego tests, right? Uh, I mean, even after 10 years, I still feel this, well, what, two weeks ago or wh when was it when we had this big, you know, global, a global crash in general, but I, I still feel it because I do look at the dollars in some way, right? Of course. Of but course. the main thing I a always ask myself when I, f when I feel that is like, okay, did any fundamentals change? And the answer is no, but the answer is always no. And that is the entire point. That's where the value comes from, right? Like, yeah. Oh, Bram, yeah. you just made a very, very important point. You've been in this industry. Did you say you've been in the industry for 10 years? Well, on and off, yes. <laughs> but uh, so yeah. 10 years, you've yeah. been watching this and slowly learning about it. Mm. And still a move like two weeks ago can make you think, oh, shit. Right, because I still feel it. Yes, correct. Of course, because yeah. of two things. One, you've been indoctrinated to think that U.S. dollar or euros are the most important thing because that is what defines your life. Right, yes. for you to pay for your housing, for your family, for your food, for the rest of it, that's all denominated in euros and dollars. So, of course, you have this link to that world. Because right now you're not paying for anything in Bitcoin, right? Eventually it will become the unit of account and, you know, everything will likely be done on Lightning or some other layer two that, that works efficiently. Yeah. Um, but until that time, you're always going to have this unit bias problem. Always, even after 10 years of looking at this and you've been looking at it for longer than I have. You know, so imagine new listeners to your show and imagine how hard it is for them to look at it and go, oh, 49,000, that's a buying opportunity. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah, it is really hard. It's also, um, I love the stats also around this, right? Like, uh, if you want to trade Bitcoin, you have to pay attention for like eight days in the entire year or something like that's where you can actually trade and benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, 
anyway, I think you should trade in the beginning or whatever you think you should do, right? And then, uh, and then you will lose a bit and then you will understand that you, you might be not be a trader. Um, you know, and then, and then you move on to, uh, just holding it. Um, that's how I went. I did day trade for like three months. And then after three months, I was like, okay, this is not, uh, this is not, uh, not for me. And I have less Bitcoin than I had at that, um, at that moment in time. Right. So, I, I mean, it's, it's a valuable lesson eventually, you know, in, in, in building your understanding and, and the conviction. How it happens to everyone. And it's part of the ego death, right? I think so. You thinking you can beat the market, the, the, you know, and that's why the, the very famous Bitcoin mantra, stay humble and stack sats, I think is really important mantra for yeah. anyone coming into the space. This is, this is savings technology. And just because the German police are going to wake up one morning and sell 50,000 Bitcoin into the market on July 4th weekend, does not mean that the asset is worth anything less. In Definitely. fact, contrary, that's when you should be buying. But if you're mucking around trying to trade it, you can get caught wrong on these things that have no logical sense in the performance of what this asset is doing. So, yeah. yeah. So what's your view on the current state of institutional adoption? Do you, do you see it as like a Trojan, a Trojan horse? Is it Bitcoin needs Wall Street or Wall Street needs Bitcoin? I think uh, Wall Street needs Bitcoin, of course, um, because, you know, you look at it again, sitting down with the investor that I was sat with at lunch yesterday. He has to pay attention. Bitcoin has an average Kager of 56% since its inception. That is better than Renaissance Capital, which is the best hedge fund in the world. Um, no investor can beat it. That's 15 years of 56% average return a year. Yeah. It's absolutely mind boggling. And I wouldn't be surprised to see it continue at very close to that rate. I think maybe 30 or 40% is entirely possible because you are going to get an exponential run. So institutions are starting to realize it. You've got pension funds like Wyoming. I think it's Wisconsin. Yeah, I think it's Wisconsin. Yeah. That have started to add the ETF. They add it, which means every other of the top 10 pensions in the US are going to say, hang on a minute. Why have you got that in your portfolio? Um, I think, you know, BlackRock put out a very interesting paper a couple of years ago where they stated that the correct allocation for Bitcoin should have been about 85%. Yeah. I think it was 82. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, this is, this is an asset that can continue to produce absolutely ridiculous returns because it's not just an asset. It's so much more than that. It's the base of our financial system. It's truth in a financial system. And you vote with where you put your money and who's going to vote for truth over complete, um, deception and theft. You're going to vote for truth all day long. Yeah. So Bitcoin is inevitable. It's I think just, that's, uh, yeah, that's also for millennials. I think a big point is what you just said. You vote with your money, right? As long as you keep using the old money that is mm -hmm. clearly created to work against you, literally mm -hmm. work, you have to work against it. Mm -hmm after your job or your venture, when you come home, you have to do more work to mitigate the debasement of, of the reward that you just got. Um, yeah. If you keep using that, you, you are feeding that, that, that flywheel basically. Um, Absolutely. and, and that's why you need to step out. And I, I think that's also where the second or third order effects of people moving to Bitcoin comes from. Like, uh, go governments have to start paying attention if they want money from you, right? In the form of taxes to do whatever. Um, yeah, they, 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 they will show their true colors at some point, right? Um, try to block it or the exits or all these things. As you may have sort of gathered, I'm very interested in how Bitcoin can help the people that need it most. Mm -hmm. And 
So that's why I have a particular focus on South America. And I know a lot of people in Argentina and, you know, I've seen what it's done for El Salvador already. You wait until El Salvador issues some sort of financial product, be it a energy backed bond or, or sorry, a volcano backed bond where they, let's say, issue a billion dollars of a bond. They use the money to build infrastructure around the volcano to start mining Bitcoin. They use part of the money to buy Bitcoin and holders get not just a yield on their money, but they get a return in Bitcoin as well. Yeah. Because they've got yield coming out of the Bitcoin farms. Once El Salvador does this, that will be the moment where we see complete breakout of nation state adoption. It becomes to your earlier point, geopolitical game theory. You imagine a country like Argentina, which has, you can't even imagine how big the resources are in Argentina. It's just a terribly managed country. And we are hopefully looking towards a future with Argentina where we potentially could start to harness some of that power to start generating Bitcoin using Bitcoin mining. And Argentina could return to the very prosperous, wealthy nation that it once was. Yeah. Now, if you're a citizen of Argentina, I mean, prior to maybe the last few months, but uh, inflation was at 130%, uh, sorry, uh, 70%. No, sorry, it was 130% at one point. It hit that high. Now, you imagine that you are trying to deal with that as an honest person with no savings, trying to just feed your family. I mean, it's so destructive yeah. that your money is doing that. And I think, you know, more and more people, fortunately, in Argentina are voting for the truth in their money and using Bitcoin. But I think once you start to see El Salvador do that, that will be a landmark moment which will wake up other countries, rich in resource, energy resources particularly, to be able to go out there and say, okay, we're now going to start removing the IMF debt, which has a chokehold on our country and our citizens, and actually take responsibility and move ourselves back to being a prosperous nation, which every nation deserves. Yeah. So how, how would you see that play out? Like, what are your, I, li I like the speculation around this the global game theory. I, I, I also think that countries with fast limited or fast natural energy resources, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, there is a very simple pitch for them. I had Samson Mao on uh, before, like his pitch is not even about Bitcoin. His pitch is about how much energy could you, uh, create or well consume basically, right? Or harvest from whatever it has been given to you just based on your location in the world, right? And mm. can you harvest and use everything? And the general answer is no, but with Bitcoin, uh, it's yes, right? Yeah. Like you, you can harvest way more energy and actually do something productive, uh, with it that's valuable. Yeah, and, uh, exactly yeah. It. It's yeah. exactly it. Energy is, is money, essentially. And yes. you, you talked about it earlier. You talked about the energy of the chicken laying the egg, mm -hmm. right? Energy is, is the value, right? And so when you can connect that, that money to energy, which is essentially what Bitcoin is, it's monetizing energy, then you can start to really have the benefit of being an energy rich nation. And you look at, Africa, you look at, you know, they've been held back for years by, you know, colonial weaponry that continues today in the form of financial repression. Um, I think there's 17 countries that have the French operate their currency. Yeah. The French basically just buy all their commodities at a discount and print more of their currency and Correct. manipulate it. Yeah. I mean, how can this still go on? But it does. And, you know, these countries can start to take responsibility back into their own hands. Now, of course, some countries will, you know, the, the leadership will do the wrong thing and try and line their own pockets. But I do genuinely believe that there are enough people in these countries that have suffered for long enough 
that we'll start to see and understand with people like Samson running around the world to understand how they can actually remove the debt burden from their countries that stifle uh, their progress and their growth. And, you know, it'll be, it'll be like a, sec- a second renaissance for many of these countries. Argentina, I think, particularly has a huge opportunity here to be one of the first movers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's something that I, I'm very supportive of. So where do you think we are in terms of adoption? Like how early are we? Are we still early? We're super early. Um, you know, I mean, you and I have talked about this before and I, I saw you did a poll on Twitter the other day of how many people actually understand Bitcoin to the point where, like you said, on that Monday, two weeks ago, when Bitcoin hit 49,000, they're thinking, you know, what can I sell to buy more Bitcoin, right? Can I sell my car? Can I sell, my, you know, my chairs? Um, you know, how many people are at that point of understanding what a gift this asset is to humanity on multiple levels? And, you know, I see that we've already hit time for your podcast, but, you know, we could talk about this for hours. The, I have time. If you have time, I have the, time. I have a the, few more questions. The, the, the point is that this this just has no bounds. And we are so, so early in terms of the pe- people's understanding. Yeah. And we're so, so early in corporate boards being comfortable with it, being able to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. You know, the only reason MicroStrategy could do what they did was because Michael Saylor owned so much of that company and yeah. controlled that board as CEO and essentially executive chairman. And, you know, that's a rare thing today. And nation states the same. The only people that can really take the risk are countries that have no other hope, like El exactly, Salvador yeah. was. Nothing was to lose. Yeah. Drowning in crime and drowning in debt and everything was just broken. And they could take a risk like that. Yeah. But, you know, other countries, it's, it's going to be harder. Other I think that's also so, harder. yeah. I think that's also so poetic. Yeah. Right. The, 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 the hubris that comes with the exploitation of other countries and thinking, uh, yeah, you already have it all basically. Right. I, 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 I love that just to, I, I think it's very logical. It's very clear, right? That adopting Bitcoin, uh, for these types of countries that are at, uh, the lower end of the stick, basically, or shorter end of the stick is super beneficial and will lead them to a more prosperous place. And mm. yeah, the more richer countries, the countries that have um, colonized other countries, abused other countries. You mentioned the CFA, Frank, you know, uh, the that's where the, all the trouble in Niger started, I think like a year ago, right? They have all the uranium, I think, yeah. and they export 90% of the uranium to France and France pays them in the currency that they print. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, once you dive into that stuff, I, uh, uh, I, it makes you less happy being part of the West, at least in my case, I think, uh, it's, uh, yeah. th- that, that's, that practice is horrendous. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. But you can vote against it, Bram. <laughs> perhaps perhaps yeah you can yeah. vote with your money yeah exactly <laughs> right exactly um but yeah how many people understand bitcoin and its implications yeah it, 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 it's fun to jam about i said like 100k right a use head <laughs> i don't know N- not a lot <laughs> way 10, way less yeah 10, 10k yeah yeah i think you know i mean look you're someone who's very involved in the industry You've been in the space for 10 years. You've obviously been passionate about it for at least half that time because you told me that, mm. that your sort of come to Jesus moment was 2019 with that same podcast. So you've probably been talking about Bitcoin nonstop for five years. So basically, yeah. To all your friends, to all your family, to all your network, yeah. how many of those people do you count as being absolute veterans? of this asset and being able to turn around and going, I'm selling everything to buy Bitcoin when it crashes to 5,000. Four, 
Five, oh. maybe. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. you are what I would say is someone somewhat of a Bitcoin educator. I mean, you have your own podcast, you're, mm. you know, five people. I'm, I'm that annoying guy by now. I I don't try anymore, but I like to, I don't know, I like to talk about politics or global stuff. And, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. Eventually you can lead everything back to broken money. Yeah. <laughs> That's very annoying. Uh, even people I know in politics, for example, they are like, oh, there he is again talking about the money and anything. But you are in charge of the money and you have no clue. So maybe... And I think that's also what I want to emphasize while we're talking about it. I think it should be more of like an invitation, right? It's never, you know, mm. go buy Bitcoin. It's like study Bitcoin. I had no clue about all of these things. I was super yeah. ignorant, right? I had to work at a bank for a colleague to tell me that the money in the bank wasn't mine, right? Like, you know, so it, it is very hard. No one teaches you when you're younger. In a Western country, money always works, right? So there's no incentive to figure uh, this out. But in general, we are getting to a point where the sustainability of this uh, money system is being questioned. You see it's cracking left and right. Mm -hmm. A lot of examples in uh, countries that don't even have their own currency, right? Or a country like Argentina that has gone bankrupt, uh, I don't know, <laughs> 50 times in 50 years. I don't know. That's not the accurate number, but no, that's you catch my drift, you know, and we do not have a different money system. We have the exact same money system, right? So that I hope, you know, also by having conversations like this, it's just an invitation to people to be curious and be like, okay, let's see what this is all about. Right. And just start somewhere with educating yourself. Yeah. I look, I think it's important. I had, uh, had dinner with a friend recently. A uh, German guy, and he he said, uh, joking, jokingly at the dinner, he said, "Rich, I'm about to sell my business. Should I put all the money into Bitcoin?" And yeah, obviously, my answer was, "Well, where else are you going to put it?" Yeah, and uh, you know, by the end of the dinner, of course, he was like wanting to put most of his money into Bitcoin. But I said, "Please don't do that, because otherwise." When it goes down, your wife is going to call me and <laughs> yes. scream at me and yes. say, my stupid husband listened to me and, and, you know, how irresponsible am I and the rest of it and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So you need to, you must take responsibility. And I think this is a lesson for everyone who listens. Mm -hmm. You must take the responsibility to understand this asset, to do the work to understand what the hell we've been talking about for the last hour and 20 minutes um, and understand the white paper, you know, to try and make sense of it, at least read it, try and make sense of it. Um, it's not a completely complicated document, um, but then start to explore money, how it works. A very good reference point always is the Bitcoin standard as a book to read. But there are multiple other books that are fantastic. A friend of mine's just written a book called First Principles of Bitcoin. And that oh, that's will be coming great. out soon. Um, it's a fantastic book. Um, but also listen to podcasts and education channels like this. Um, I think I mentioned to you that I'm going to be launching a podcast uh, in the next few weeks as well. Uh, we're calling it Seize the Future. It's not a Bitcoin podcast. Um, like you, I like talking about some of the issues in the world and understanding them on a deeper level. So the guests that I will be having on the show are people that understand, for example, geopolitics or the functioning of the WEF or the United Nations and policy decisions around this type of thing. And, you know, what are the issues around climate change? And then I always ask them at the end of the interview, Okay, so with this issue in mind and thinking forward to the future, how are you allocating your capital? And what do you think about allocating your capital? Because at the end of the day, I'm in the business of asset management. So yeah. I think, uh, you know, I think that's always a, a very interesting conversation. And to try and, to your point, what's very interesting at many of these conversations is it often comes back to Bitcoin. Because if you've thought about the problems of the world enough, you get to the point of understanding that the financial system is one 
is probably the root cause of every major issue in the world. And once you understand that, then you see that Bitcoin is the solution. It's your vote to get out of that system. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for the three last questions? Sure. Okay. You just mentioned uh, also, uh, you know, the, f the fair value that there's a discount. Like, what are your f thoughts around future future price? And yeah, what is the fair value? Well, the fair value is, you know, multiple millions. Um, it's the financial system divided by 21 million. Um, and that is obviously, we're not there yet. We're not at every single person voting like you for Bitcoin. But as I said, I think it's inevitable that people will vote for truth over deception and theft. Um, where do we go in the near term is always a very hard question. Um, I do believe that Bitcoin operates in cycles and the halving is a very clever piece of technology that Satoshi put into the algorithm to create a knee-jerk liquidity impulse four times a year, interestingly, always around the presidential election um, and likely liquidity bursts of the fiat money supply um, just when Bitcoin becomes even more scarce. So I do think we will continue to have these impulses that track the halving. Um, and, you know, many people say, oh, well, you know, the halving is not going to be so important later on, but actually it will be in terms of, if you think about the actual flow versus the stock. Um, so it will become in a funny kind of way, even more scarce and more important. And so liquidity bursts will have even more of an impact. Yeah. Um, so I think you'll get this sort of S curve, um, type thing where you see another gap higher uh, after the middle section. Um, but where do we go now? I think in the next six to 18 months, we will touch $150,000 to $200,000. Um, I actually had predicted that for last cycle, um, but last cycle was hampered somewhat by the Chinese, the Elon Musk situation, uh, also, and of course, FTX. Um, so I think, um, it was really, really stimmied in terms of what it could have done. We could have gone a lot higher last cycle. Yeah. So I think we'll make that up and I think it will actually drive things even higher this cycle. Um, you've got the talk of the U S becoming strategically involved in Bitcoin. I can tell you now that many other nation states will be having the conversation about how it could benefit their country to adopt it, Bitcoin. So I think in the next year to two years, you're going to see uh, a flurry of interest around nation state level adoption. Corporate adoption is starting. Michael Saylor always talks about the fact that MicroStrategy was a zombie company before he implemented a Bitcoin strategy. Well, Japan, where I did a decent portion of my career, is the home of the zombie company. And there are so many zombie companies in Japan. Yeah. And you've now got the first Japanese company that is implementing the micro strategy playbook. Yeah. And they met a planet. Um, and once they do that, um, and do that successfully, there are hundreds of thousands of companies in Japan that will start looking to implement a sim similar strategy. So again, first mover always does the best, but the second, third, fourth, and fifth will also do very, very well. Same as with nation state adoption. Same way it's benefited El Salvador, it can benefit Indonesia, it can benefit Argentina, it can benefit countries in Africa. Um, but you know, Bram, when, when that stuff starts happening, you can forget about your 150,000, 200,000. But that's why going, Bitcoin is so entertaining now, don't you think? Like just watching this unfold. Yeah. 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 We're sitting in the middle of an absolute paradigm shift. And, you know, the Overton window on what is acceptable to talk about at nation state, you know, sovereign level of investment 
has shifted entirely. We are in a new paradigm. It's just a matter of time now. It's going to be interesting uh, where it goes, uh, but uh, I think uh, you, similar to me, uh, you're just sitting and watching, right? Uh, yeah. We're just watching it unfold. But I always like to, you know, kind of uh, just, you know, think about it and uh, and hear these different uh, different thoughts. So, yeah, what what has been over the years that you now dismissed it, found it again, studied, went all in? What has been your biggest insight studying Bitcoin over the years? Like how, how has it changed your, your worldview? It's really been about the truth aspect and how that permeates to everything else. Um, and the unfairness that the traditional finance, financial system is, um, you know, teachers, firemen, the people that add so much to society are the least well paid and don't understand anything about the financial system. As you rightly said, this stuff isn't taught in school. You know, they don't teach finance. They don't teach balancing a budget. They don't teach any of the stuff that would be inherently useful in terms of navigating this world um, when it comes to managing your finances. And I think that is so unfair. Um, and I was a banker before, you know, I was someone that was very focused on, you know, my annual bonus and how much I could get my team paid and all this stuff. And I think what it's changed about me is that I'm definitely not so focused on money. Um, I understand that family is the most important thing. Um, and you know, you need to be there for your family and you need to be genuinely present for people. And I think that Bitcoin allows you to relax. It allows you, you know, you know, you've got the hardest asset. You know that Bitcoin is inevitable. And so to your point earlier, you can just sit back and let it be. So long as you have a little bit of Bitcoin, you're going to be absolutely fine. Your family's going to be safe. Um, and you can protect your family and you can then focus on your family. And it just really, it, because the problem is when you're on the fiat treadmill, it doesn't matter how much money you're earning because you know that money can just disappear and be devalued. So you're always just running faster. I just got to get more money. I just got to get more money. Yeah. And, and so this is the thing. And unless you're extremely good at investing your money, You've always got to be on that treadmill just running because God knows what could happen. Another COVID comes along, they devalue the money by 25 to 40 percent, whatever it was that they did to the US dollar uh, over the course of COVID. So that's 40 percent of your l life's work just disintegrated. Yeah. Right there. So, yeah, uh, once you discover Bitcoin and you really understand it for what it is, it, it just becomes relaxing. Um, and it means that you can focus on the important things in life, helping people that are less fortunate, uh, being with your family, spending that time with your kids, you know, making sure that they understand the important things in the world. They understand kindness. They understand generosity and, um, helping people that are less, less well off than themselves. And I think that, you know, it, it, it sounds very virtuous. To say these things, and I, you know, almost cringe at myself as an English person <laughs> uh, saying these things, but uh, it, it's true. It's really true. You you end up with just a greater love for the world and for humanity. And mm. I do believe, and this is a whole different conversation. I've been reading a very interesting book lately called the. Can you see that? The origins and history of consciousness. Yes. Oh, I have a book for you, sir. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I believe that Bitcoin can help us move towards an elevated state of consciousness because yes. it's you, you become more uh, ingrained with your fellow man and humanity. And there's something really, truly beautiful about that. And I think Bitcoin is some sort, I haven't worked it out yet, but it's some sort of key 
to elevated consciousness. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. Me too. And for anyone listening, if you go to episode 23, I talk with Eric V. Stacks. We talk about shifting your consciousness through Bitcoin. I think you will love that too, uh, Rich. Great. Uh, awesome. That, uh, I think that aspect of adopting Bitcoin is still very underexplored. Mm -hmm. Um, yesterday I had a recording with, uh, with Vivian and we talked about a similar thing where because you are off that treadmill, because you stored the, the energy that you got as a reward for your work in something that cannot be debased, it gives you more time to think about these big things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why am I here? Why yeah. are we all here? What is going on? You know, where are we? You know, and uh, I, I, I think when you start exploring these topics, you will end up on the main topic, which is, well, if you think about who am I, what is myself, right? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you end up on, on the consciousness plain, I would say. And uh, yeah, I, I have exactly the similar experience. If if you would have asked me uh, 10 years back, would you be, uh, I have here a, a book that, that I will send to you too. It's called Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Mechanics of Consciousness by Itzhak Bentov, who was uh, actually center architect of the entire like CIA wing that explored uh, consciousness and stuff. He has incredibly interesting talks and this book, right? Uh, yeah. If you would have asked me five years ago, would you be exploring this stuff? I would have said, no, probably not. But in some way, you know, I'm here too. So I think it's, it's very interesting that, um, yeah. that you all also end up in, in a similar place. Um, maybe you already answered your answer to my last question was already in the previous answer, but I, I always ask everyone the same question. At, uh, as, as a last question, which is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? <sighs> That's, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think love is the center of everything. And when you have kids, you discover what true love really is and you would do anything for your child and um you know you you discover what love is for for the first time properly i was <laughs> sat with an investor today that's about to have a baby and so i was talking to him about this and i think it's extremely exciting but i think yeah i, I talk about it a lot i think if you operate from a position of love then the universe gives you love back and uh it's yeah there's something to all of this this consciousness and um and everything is truly connected so um yeah i i definitely believe in that i often or sometimes m more than sometimes often falter from approaching the world with love mm -hmm. because we're learning all the time and sometimes i can get frustrated or angry at things but yeah it's whenever i do then the world just changes. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing thing. So yeah, I would say that, that love is a, is a very core, uh, part of everything that we've been talking about. Right. I think so too. Yeah. Amazing. This is a great ending, man. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thought it was incredible. I think, uh, we, uh, we did well. I hope uh, people enjoy it and I uh, want to thank you for your time. Hopefully see you in Amsterdam uh, in October at the conference. And uh, yeah, maybe we can do this again. If they have a podcast studio, we should just uh, hit it yeah. up. So uh, thanks, man. Absolutely, Bram. And it, it was a pleasure. And as I said to you before, I think what you're doing with this show is so important. So very happy to support you anytime uh, if you want to come and, and as you say, do it again. Thank you. Appreciate that. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. 
I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye. 